partnership with the Washington Examiner. We're bringing you engaging, intelligent talk, Sang style, on this Tuesday, March 31st, which, by the way, is my mother's birthday. So, Mom, happy birthday. So I want to read a passage here from an article I saw in the Wall Street Journal entitled, GM Hustles to Pump Out Ventilators to Fight Coronavirus. When President Trump last week criticized General Motors Company's effort to produce ventilators, GM executives were flabbergasted. They felt the company was being unfairly targeted by the president, say people familiar with their thinking. GM had begun collaborating with a ventilator company a couple of weeks earlier. It had mobilized more than 1,000 employees and nearly 100 auto suppliers to start making the machines, which can be used to help patients with the disease caused by the new coronavirus. So President Trump moved forward on Friday with this order, saying General Motors has to begin producing ventilators. Well, they were already on track to do it. Is it wise for the President of the United States to force a company that is already embarking on a task to do that task? Or should the company and other companies, if they are taking the initiative themselves, be able to do so freely? Does it matter? Is it just, you know, hey, at least the President's doing it to make sure they don't stop it? Or is there more to it? Let's talk about the use of the Defense Production Act to address this coronavirus crisis with Elizabeth Wright, who is the Director of Health and Science Policy at Citizens Against Government Waste and joins us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. Elizabeth, hello and welcome. Uh, Hello to you, Jimmy, and happy birthday to your mother. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman, and it's great to have you here. I appreciate you joining us. So, Let me ask you first to give us a little bit of a primer on the Defense Production Act, and then we'll talk about some of the very apt points you made in a piece, interestingly enough, published overnight Friday on this very topic. Well, the Defense uh, Production Act was implemented just before the Korean War, and its effort was to try to uh, speed up production of military supplies. And so it, it could be used to Uh, require or get companies to produce items that the military um, needed. And uh, there had been a lot of pressure on President Trump to um, invoke the act uh, again for the coronavirus uh, because of the shortage that we had for so many um, variety of medical devices out there. Um, He did uh, invoke it, but he did not want to enforce it because he didn't think it was right to uh, force a company to do something. And that was something that we uh, agreed with. And that's why I I wrote and submitted the editorial on Thursday uh, to the Washington Examiner. And then during that period of time, uh, he did uh, enforce GM to uh, produce ventilators, uh, ventilators. You know, it was so striking because, as you point out in your piece, these companies were already taking initiative. Ford, GM, yesterday the president was highlighting my pillow and what they're doing to create thousands of face masks in a short span of time. So I think the biggest question, first of all, is, biggest first question, is, is this kind of a decision on the part of the president to implement and then execute on the Defense Production Act necessary when companies are already embarking on it? Uh, No, I don't think so. First of all, this is, uh, it's going to range how difficult this can be. Um, Some companies may have the equipment, uh, like the the, uh, Mike from MyPillow, he has equipment where he could switch over pretty easily and make a pretty uh, simple device. Um, The device that the face mask he's making is not going to be used um, by uh, healthcare professionals that are working directly with uh, people with the virus, but other professionals in the hospitals uh, that uh, may be de- just delivering meals and stuff like that. A-, a ventilator is pretty sophisticated, and you just can't uh, turn on a dime and manufacture those. Um, they had already, uh, from what I had read, had already uh, joined and aligned themselves with a ventila- uh, ventilator company Um, in Washington state, and they were on their way to produce these devices. 
uh, it takes time. Uh, I mean, if you look back at World War II, when a lot of the production was switched over to make tanks and uh, battleships, that took time to scale up for that kind of military hardware. And for some of these medical devices that are being asked to be manufactured, some of them are very sophisticated, require very sophisticated parts uh, that you just can't uh, get a, and produce at a, a drop of the dime. So uh, that's why you know we felt that um, uh, companies were stepping forward. I listed several companies in the op-ed that were stepping forward without uh, just because they know it's their duty and because they're Americans and they want to help. So uh, we don't think that uh, it was necessary to use it um, in any case and, and nor in this case either. Right. Uh, Elizabeth Wright, our guest from Citizens Against Government Waste, uh, the company that General Motors has partnered up with is Vantech. It is a small maker of ventilators. Their operation much smaller than GM car dealerships even, but they are working together to try to maximize output and get these things ramped up already. But the big question that a lot of folks have been wondering is why this even is a big deal. I mean, yesterday I had a guest on, Elizabeth, who was saying, look, okay, so General Motors is already doing it. How does it hurt to have the federal government, the president of the United States, say, keep doing what you're doing because we want to make sure that you don't stop doing what you're doing. That well, there's no harm in kind of doubling up on it. Well, I think you know part of it is the approach. I mean, they were doing it, um, and it does take time. But I think just in sort of the general overall uh, problem with the DPA is that we do have private businesses in the United States, um, and we really don't like the idea of the government coming in and telling them what they should or should not do. Um, I, I don't know what kinds of discussions went on between the president and the company, but, um, you know, it seems to me that, that they were doing it. it. They are starting from scratch. They have to work with engineers that they don't even, you know, engineers who are not familiar with each other's product. Um, they got to figure all that stuff out and that just takes time. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure it was necessary, but I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't listening to the conversations, uh, but generally I think, uh, you know, this is not necessary and, and companies are stepping up, will step up if they can do it. And that's the important thing. They've got to be able to do it because, as I mentioned, some of these products are extremely, extremely sophisticated to, to produce. When you have a federal government or any government make the decision to force a company to produce a product, in my view, you better have a darn good reason to be saying that. And there isn't one in this case, because as we point out, these companies were already taking that sort of initiative. Yes, it was taking time. Yes, it will continue to take time. But that's because of the nature of shifting over these facilities to produce products that are those original, uh, the, the original intention for those manufacturing uh, factories were, was not for. I want to read a paragraph from your op-ed in the Washington Examiner, a partner publication titled, Trump doesn't need the Defense Production Act when manufacturers are already stepping up. You note, at the time President Trump, at the time you submitted this, President Trump had done it. By the time that it was published, he had just done it. But right. if Trump did use this power, you write Elizabeth Wright, it could lead to unprecedented restrictions on private companies, such as those included in Nancy Pelosi's Take Responsibility for Families and Workers Act, under which companies that receive aid from the federal government will have to comply with diversity mandates, report on the demographics of their employees and supply chains, and restructure their corporate boards to allow labor unions to appoint one-third of their members. That kind of thing gives the president and the federal government a lot of power over a company if they, even in the short term, decide to nationalize an aspect of that company's operation. Uh, yes, it does, and that's and that's our concern. Um, we are America. We believe in private companies. We believe that uh, they should uh, produce what they want to produce, um, and opening that door uh, can set a, a, a bad precedent for uh, more uh, mischief. Now, uh, the president's a businessman. He understands uh, how businesses are. So I'm I'm hoping and and, and I don't uh, I hope that this is uh, this is as far as it gets, 
But as uh, mentioned in the uh, bill that uh, Speaker Pelosi produced um, and wanted to have a lot of that uh, attached to the, the last uh, emergency uh, spending bill that was just uh, signed into law, there was a lot of provisions in there that got the government's uh, foot in the door, uh, really controlling how a, um, a company would work and the kind of employees uh, they were going to uh, have to hire, whether they were uh, qualified or not. There was no indication of that. So um, it it's, uh, it's, can set a dangerous precedent, and, and that's what we are concerned about. One thing that always should be top of mind, in my view, Elizabeth, when we come upon a crisis, and so different actions are taken to address a clear and present danger, in this case, coronavirus, Okay, we understand the impetus. We understand that something needs to be done to address the crisis. But once you make a decision as a government on a course of action, as you point out, that creates a precedent, which therefore someone in the future can point to and say, hey, this happened during this crisis. Now, this is a different crisis, but it's a crisis nonetheless. Why don't we use the same kind of authority here? Or maybe they try to work another situation and say, well, this is going to be a crisis, so we might as well take the initiative now. In other words, whether you're in the midst of a crisis or not, you need to be concerned about the precedent that you set for the future as best you can, despite all the pressures put by the public and by the media, by politicians, whatever those pressure sources are. Uh, uh, we agree. Uh, it, this something like this, um, has to be used very sparingly. I, I hope this is it, um, and uh, that it, it uh, um, that we don't have to do it again. But and I and like I said, I think companies are stepping forward and doing a great job. We should be proud of the companies here in the United States. Uh, it is amazing what you read about what they're doing and how they're switching over production to to attack this virus. Um, I think they're proving that uh, this law is not needed. And I hope that uh, this is the last time that we see it used. I would hope so as well. Elizabeth Wright, Director of Health and Science Policy at Citizens Against Government Waste. So great to talk with you today. Great piece in the Washington Examiner. Really appreciate well, it. And stay healthy and well, please. I will, and you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Again, Elizabeth Wright joining us from Citizens Against Government Waste. Again, the title of her piece you should check out, Trump doesn't need the Defense Production Act when manufacturers are already stepping up.